out, joined the NFL in 1976 as a line judge, became a referee in 1980, and retired in 2003. He worked in three Super Bowls, Super Bowl 22 in 1988, Super Bowl 28 in 1994, and Super Bowl 34 in 2000. He is the only referee to officiate in a Super Bowl in three different decades, and his final game was the uh, Pro Bowl in 2003. Let's welcome in Bob Mack. We want to bring, bring your uh, – there you go. How you doing, Big Mac? Thank you, Bill. My pleasure. All right. And my second distinguished guest is he officiated his first game in 1980 – and worked his last game on 11th, uh, April 11, 2010, against the Rain Philadelphia against the Rangers. During his career, he called over 1,904 game regular season games. Wow. He worked in 13 Stanley Cup Finals and officiated Whoa. in 261 playoff games, which Jeez. currently hold the record for uh, games regular season games worked and playoff games worked. Let's welcome in. Uh, to the locker room, Curry Fraser. Oh, Curry, Curry, good to see you. Ooh. <laughs> now you're welcome. Well, yeah, exactly. We're, we're going to talk about the booze here in a yeah, little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, well, actually, my name is Fraser Sucks. But. And my third distinguished guest. He, middle name. <laughs> his first game was worked in 1986. He retired in 2011. He officiated uh, 1,264 regular season games. He worked 190 playoff games and 18 NBA finals. He is now working as a rules analyst for uh, ESPN. He does you do the marquee games and you hey, also uh, work uh, play, through the play, throughout the playoffs. Let's welcome into the locker room Steve Javi. What's up, Steve? Thanks, Billy. Yeah. Great to be here with these guys. Great to be here with you. Well, I got to tell you, uh, Curry got the ball rolling. I I called Curry a couple weeks ago and I said. Uh, Curry, I would like to do a round table. I'd like to have a referee show. And uh, Curry said, anything you need, Billy, anything you need. And all three of you guys have been great with me. Uh, but then when I called Javi, he, he, when I told him Big Mac was available, he went nuts. No doubt about because it. you have a relationship with, with Bob McAwee. Amazing. It really does. The, uh, the NFL officials, my dad was an NFL official for 30 years and worked with the Bob McAwee. The best ever. Here. <laughs> uh, the best ever. That's nice of you to say, Bob. And I, my, I, as I said to Bob earlier today, the NFL officials are so close to my heart because I was growing up and I was a sports junkie as a kid and following my dad around all these fields. And this is, Mac, this is before the officials had to be there the night before. Right. I would get on the train with my dad to go up to New York, yep. Yankee Stadium, and Chris Shankel taking me uh, wow. and showing me the, the house that Ruth built. That's a name and going down the past. To, yeah, how about that name? <laughs> Chris but no, I mean, the NFL officials just, they actually, I grew up with them. They just took me under their wing like I was their like little nephew being a, you know, probably is a little bother to him, but uh, no. But Mac, had so many great memories with Bob McAvoy here. Just a wonderful gentleman and a phenomenal official. Well, uh, I, I'll second that, Curry. Growing up, I grew up with uh, with uh, Bob McAvoy's son, Scott McAvoy, who is now officiating in the Big Ten, and uh, of course he had a great mentor. Uh, but I always was amazed, Curry, at all the the the, the, the rules, the, the size of the rule book. He, he was like he should be a lawyer or something. The the book Bob was thick as it could be. A lot of well, rules. A lot of rules. A lot of rules. Well, when you have 22 guys all moving at the same time, you need a lot of rules. But yeah, but you don't have any pucks going around and sticks going around. <laughs> I, I'd like to go back to the jabby thing for just a moment. Uh, when when they brought me into the NFL, they put me with the best, who was Stan Jabby. Well, I lived over in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and the Jabbies lived over in on the other side of Philly, mm -hmm. on Lafayette Avenue. Lafayette Hill. Right mm -hmm. in Lafayette Hill. So st when I came on the crew, Stan said to me, you will come to my house. We're going to work games on Sunday. You will be at my house every Monday night for dinner. <laughs> and my wife, Stella, will cook your dinner. But you will be there, and we will review the rules, and we will review the game. And every Monday night for two years, I walked in that door and sat with his dad, who was the master. He was the master. So you didn't cut any corners there, I'm sure. So a funny thing happened. They put me on a playoff game down in Dallas when Stolbeck was down there, which he was a Navy player as well as I was. But anyway, uh, there was a play between Stan and I. I was a line judge, and he was the back judge. And the ball went in low, and Stan signaled the thing complete. And I'm looking in. I got a better look than he does. <laughs> and I said, that damn thing hit the ground. So I ran up there, me running up to Stan Javi in a playoff game. And I said, Stan, that thing hit the ground. And I waved it off. 
And he looked at me, his eyes got as big as saucers. <laughs> and he went with me. I'll never forget. In the locker room after the game, he said to me, Mac, on that play, you became an official. Oh, wow. wow. And I, and mm -hmm. I remembered that mm -hmm. my whole life mm -hmm. because uh, I had the ignorance or the common sense or the, or the guts to say, that damn thing hit the ground. I'm taking that away from him. Good for you. But he was the greatest ever. His father was the greatest uh, thanks, ever. Thanks, Matt. That's really nice to say here. Hey, uh, Curry, walking in here, I mean, you you met these, you, you met these guys before. You oh guys have God. like a camaraderie, even though you're not in the same sport. Uh, you guys all know each other. Billy, I, I'm so honored to be here with these legends. It's incredible. But, I, I you know, I would I would run into them. Uh, well, certainly Jav. I mean, we... We'd run into each other in uh, concierge lounges, and <laughs> we'd, you know we'd have dinner together on the road whenever we and we would look at each other's schedule to find out where we could team up. I mean, we're in the same fraternity, all of us, and the officiating minds are unique. They're different. Your skin is a little tougher, a little more leathered than uh, than most. Uh, so to be able to hang around with with like-minded guys uh, and and really good guys. I mean. These guys are salt of the earth individuals. Bob McElwee, I, I met him in his office. He was in charge of his negotiations uh, one year for the NFL officials. I was for the NHL. We'd gone through a strike and we compared notes and shared some thoughts. And, uh, you know, that's just what you do. Uh, you know, guys that uh, have been booed and cursed and, and had to maybe fight their way out of a building as I have. Had, <laughs> Which had we'll death, get into that. Had death threats and things of that sort. <laughs> and that was only from my family. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, I am really honored to have uh, the three of you guys here. We're going to break down the state of officiating in all the sports that are active right now, basketball, NFL. Of course, the playoffs are getting ready to heat up and, and the NHL. And get your thoughts on the state of, of, of officiating because uh, the officials, I think, are under a little uh, – attack on scrutiny right now more so than they ever were and, and, and i believe it's because of some of the outcomes that we've been seeing so we'll break it down we'll get a chance to tell some stories and uh we're just looking at the three of you guys here i'm i'm in awe and i and I, I thank you guys for showing up we're down here at charlie's bar if anybody want to come down here and uh meet the meet the refs and you know yeah, we've got a some few pictures open, we've got a few open tables here so let's uh <laughs> come on down and say hi i charlie's bar i used to have a place in summer's point and this this place was historic, is historic. It's awesome. The food, the drinks, the beverages. Come on down. Uh, let's bring in the new year with uh, some great officials here that, uh, excluding myself. Uh, <laughs> you won't get booed in here, Kevin. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyway. <laughs> it's amazing how much better we get when we retire, right? No doubt about it. All right. So uh, we want to thank Charlie's Bar for hosting this event. And we're going to uh, do a little business right now. I want to... Uh, I want to thank the people of Charlie's Bar, Jeff Thomas and Jimmy Thomas. It's also brought to you by Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtor, Realtors with offices in Northfield, Brigantine, Margate, Ocean City, Sea Isle, Avalon, and Stone Harbor. Your one-stop shop at the shore for all your real estate needs. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtors, opening doors to life's most meaningful dreams. And by Stell Exteriors. They've been providing top quality roofing and siding at affordable prices since 1996. Did you know that only 2% of roofing contractors qualify as GAF Master Elite installers? So if you do the math, choosing Stell Exteriors takes 98% of the worry out. So give Stell Exteriors a call today at six at 1-877-FIX-ROOF. That's 1-877-FIX-ROOF. All right, when we return, we'll continue with our referee roundtable. You're listening to The Locker Room with Billy Schwein on 97.3 ESPN. Locker Room. I want to remind people the first hour of the Locker Room is sponsored by Tom's River Volkswagen with over 500 cars in stock. It is the area's number one Volkswagen dealership with three loaner cars every day. We sell cars the right way every day. That's Tom's River Volkswagen. Also remind people if you're looking for a bike, buy a bike from Anarelli's Bicycles located at 1014 Asbury Avenue in Ocean City. Owners Mark and Mike insist that after the sale, it's a service that counts with a complete line of bike accessories and same-day repair service. That's Anarelli's Bicycles, 609-399-2238. Give them a call today. I want to thank, we're here at Charlie's Bar. I want to thank Jeff Thomas and the people at Charlie's Bar for hosting my referee roundtable. I'm joined with Steve Javi from the NBA, Bob McAwee from the NFL, and Curry Frazier from the NHL. And guys, since you guys have retired, Curry, there's been a lot of changes in each sport. What what sticks out in your mind? The one one or two things that really uh, you've noticed as a as a former official 
about your sport. Well, Billy, you're talking to some old dogs here. I mean, four <laughs> decades in the NHL, uh, there were a lot of changes from the Broad Street bullies and the and the over the boards brawling. Uh, to stick swinging, to fighting, to the hooking and holding, uh, Gary Bettman called obstruction, that we had to extricate. But the thing that I've uh, witnessed the most in recent since I've been out, uh, speed of the game, players bigger, faster, stronger, more tr uh, better training uh, and uh, equipment for sure. Uh, but the thing that has bothered me the most about the NHL are the head hits concussions, which the NFL uh, took a strong stand on uh, after they were sued. Uh, so the NHL is moving along in that direction. Uh, but in terms of officiating, the two referee system that we went to in about 1998 has caused some difficulties because judgments didn't mesh. The, the game was being called differently at one end by perhaps a less experienced official than at the other end. All guys are not created equal. Uh, so there's no consistency with, with the calls then because of the two official system. Well, the other thing is that the younger officials that I'm hearing from players and coaches now don't communicate as well as we did. You had to develop relationships with the players that are productive and positive uh, and not adversarial and uh, so you've got to work at that and the younger guys seem to be uh, more arrogant uh, defensive uh, they have to be right all the time they're aggressive in their conversations with the players uh, and the coaches and that's what I'm hearing that's the biggest difference uh, and they need to overcome that uh, to, to uh, get the players to play on their terms without having to raise their arm all the time call penalties or uh, you know be a be an a-hole and, and, and Curry what's what's the one thing that you guys really want the most is to not affect the game you want to you want the game to flow you want to make sure the game uh, is 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 fair Yep. And and let the guys play. Let them figure it out, right? Billy, my, my best friend as a referee was a moving puck. If I could keep <laughs> the puck moving, then guys are going to hit take their hits. They're going to go. They're going to flow. They're going to change on the on the run, on the, over the boards, change on the fly. And we're not going to have those scrums and those confrontations. Fans want to come and see sustained action and excitement. And when you get the puck, and I'd say to the young partner, hey, listen, let's keep that puck moving as, as best we can. Once I drop it and open this game, Let's get a run of three minutes. We're gonna if we get that three minute run right off the bat, we're gonna have awesome game tempo. Bob, the NFL has been taking a lot of hits lately, and uh, I know you and I've spoken about it. Uh, what what one thing is a glaring issue that you see from your well, point of view? I mean, you're not uh, you know you're watching on TV. First of all, I think everything that Curry said is right on. He's a different sport. But the thing that I see and that bothers me the most, and this man's father taught me that, your job in refereeing is to keep the game fair, keep the game safe, and keep the game under control. Now that word control is the key. Control is the key. Pete Rosell, the few times that I talked with him when I was on Jim Tunney's crew, would always say, just keep it under control. That's all I'm looking for. Now, you take the instant replay system, okay? In our day, the referee was in charge. He was responsible for the control of the game. If I went down to D.C. and they were playing, which happened, the Cowboys and they're both undefeated and we're going for all the money, and that guy ran that football, which he did. Ricky Sanders up the middle, and he got hit, and the ball came out. It, right now, it's me. Is that ball out or isn't it? It's me. It's not a machine. It's not stop the game. Now, if that same play happens, a lot of things happen. First of all, 22 guys are going to stand around in 100 degrees <laughs> or up in Green Bay in minus 10 degrees while somebody at a desk somewhere makes a decision. Quick example, Army-Navy game this year, yeah. seven-minute replay delay. These kids are in the most important Army-Navy game. Most I was there. Most important game of their life. They're standing around in 25-degree weather for seven minutes. And like Curry said, it stopped the flow of the game. So anyway, my whole point is what bothers me <clears throat> is 
the control that's lost. They have a 40-second clock now on all these different things that, uh, uh, that have been bought in four reasons. Now, in, in, when I was officiating, his dad was, we made the ball ready for play. We controlled the tempo of the game. I just heard that Matt Millen, my friend number 55 from the Raiders, just had a heart transplant the other day. Now, Matt and I had a battle every time we played the Raiders <laughs> because I, I was made the ball ready every play. So I'd put the football down, I'd blow the whistle, and 25 seconds had started. Matt would back in there calling defensive signals and deliberately kick the football <laughs> in the back of his feet. He'd do it every time. <laughs> And I'd have to push him. I'd push him out. You can't, you know, you can't touch players. You can't talk to players anymore. I'd shove him out of there. I'd say, get the hell out of here, Miller. So it's the kind of gentler, you know, you can't, <laughs> hey, it's permeating all societies. Javi, in the NBA, I mean, things have changed quite a bit since you last blew the whistle. By the way, you have your whistle here with you, I see. <laughs> uh, what, are, what are a few things in the NBA that stick out in your crawl that, uh, you know, it doesn't sit well with you the way the NBA is officiated. Well, I'm going to watch out what you say because you're an analyst too now with ESPN. First of all, is it true? <laughs> is it true, Josh, that Billy says one beer for anybody who comes in here now? So him the first beer. I don't know. If it is, guys, come on down. <laughs> it's a little too early for me, but it's maybe in about an hour. It's five o'clock so. somewhere, Jack. Exactly. <laughs> I hear what these guys are saying, and that's uh, it's a lament that most retired officials say. I will say this. I don't know if I could officiate in today's environment. Agree. Um, it's really, really difficult for these younger guys. And, Curry, I agree with um, a lot of the things you said with the younger officials. The tough part being is that the environment they've grown up in with replay review, what I call the unrealistic expectation of perfection that is now put upon all officials, always has. So they're even, trying to take the human element out of, out and, of the and game. And they have. And just what Bob described about the replay, replay review ha definitely has its p place in sports. There's no doubt about it. When it first came into the NBA with regard to the – When did it – do you know when it first came geez, in? I don't know the exact when, year, Billy, but it's about in the 90s somewhere. Okay. Um, but obviously for the last second shot, because you can only see and hear as your brain does, two-tenths, three-tenths of a second. Oh, my old boss, Daryl Garrison, on last second shots. If we got it wrong, but we were within two or three tenths of a second, he goes, no, you got it right, because your brain can't react that way. I can understand doing that or doing two or three points. The more you delve into it, the more you have delays of seven minutes and you don't keep the puck going, or as Earl Strom, the great referee, God rest his soul, would always say, get the ball and play. Let's go. Let's go. You make a call in basketball, and now basketball is a moving game more so than, than football is, like hockey is. He would just sit there, whether you're right or wrong, get the ball and play, and let's go. They forget about it, and they, right. let's get the momentum going back and forth. Um, replay review, I, I think it has its place. I think what happens, what's happening now, though, is that, and I said this to Bob before the show, is in all sports, the reason why we're saying a lot of these things or we're talking about it is because a lot of the people who are controlling the officiating never officiated. These are attorneys, these are analytics guys per se, right. and that's, cre that's crept into the officiating aspect of it. So these poor young guys come in and they want to pick the brain of a Curry Frazier and they want to pick the brain of a Bob McAwee, and they do, but then they're hearing that they just got this play wrong, but Curry said not to do it that and they're all confused. They have no idea what to do. Instead of just, you know what, relying on the officials with the experience that have control games. You're right. My dad told me the same thing, whether it be football, hockey. It's a matter of controlling the personalities, as you said, Curry, getting to know the players, coaches. And sometimes, you know what, you don't get along, but you have to find a way to get through this game. Many times we saw our schedules, guys, and you saw the team and or slash coach, and you go, oh, jeez. And we know what kind of night it's going to be because they don't like you and I don't like them. But that was the challenge. You know, the safes and the outs and the interferences and the penalties, that's all part of the game. You better be good when you get there. It's the controlling of the game and the personalities that you have to that makes you that official, that, a better official. Amen Jeff, to that. you think having three officials on the, uh, on the hardwood floor is uh, beneficial to the game or – Advantageous. No, definitely beneficial. And when I first got hired, we had two. And I, when I look back and think about it, I can't believe that two referees in the NBA actually. But what they did is they knew how to control the game, Bob. Like you said, I mean, they they're probably their call accuracy. If you were to go back to the two-man system and see the correct calls, or they would maybe be 60%. Guys now are 90%. But here's the weird thing. It's funny. Joe Crawford, my main mentor, uh, which we all know and love, 
he would always tell me, he says, he would ask guys during meetings, would you rather be 95% correct for that night, analytically, and both teams yelling at you as you went off the floor, or would you rather be 85% and they both go, hey, Bob, great job, Curry, great job, and they respected you. And that's what it's about. We're down here at Charlie's well, Bar. Come on down to Charlie's Bar and Restaurant, located at 800 Shore Road in Summers Point, New Jersey. We have our Referee Roundtable show. I'm joined with Steve Javi from the NBA, Bob McAwee, NFL, and Curry Frazier from the NHL. I want to remind people the first hour of the locker room is sponsored by Tom's River Volkswagen. Over 500 cars in stock. It is the area's number one Volkswagen dealership with free loaner cars every day. We sell cars the right way every day. That's Tom's River Volkswagen. And our Roundtable show is brought to you by Berkshire Hathaway Home Services and Fox and Roach Realtors with offices in Northfield, Brigantine, Margate, Ocean City, Seattle, Avalon, and Stone Harbor. Your one-stop shop at the store, at the shore, for all your real estate needs. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtors, opening doors to the life's most meaningful dreams. And by Stell Exteriors. They've been providing top quality roofing and siding at affordable prices since 1996. Did you know that only 2% of roofing contractors qualify as GAF Master Elite Installers? So if you do the math, choosing Stell Exteriors takes 98% of the worry out. So give Stell Exteriors a call today at 1-877-FIX-ROOF. And one more piece of business, guys. Ocean City's real estate market is red hot. You need an agent that has the knowledge and expertise to help. Contact Ocean City's top agent, Mark Grimes. Mark has been selling real estate in Ocean City or in South Jersey for 28 years, and he can answer all your real estate questions and find you the perfect property. He's available anytime on his cell at 609-425-2042. When Philadelphia star athletes are looking for a house at the beach, they contact Mark Grimes, specializing in buying and selling vacation homes, single family homes, condominiums, and duplexes, residential and commercial, as well as new construction projects or investment opportunities. Mark Rimes, he's your agent at the beach. Give him a call today, 609-425-2042, or check out his website at grimes.com. All right, when we return, we'll continue our referee roundtable here at Charlie's Bar. You're listening to The Locker Room with Billy Schwein on 97.3 ESPN. Back here in The Locker Room on 97.3 ESPN, by my referee roundtable show with a couple of the game's great, Steve Javi from the NBA, Bob McAwee from the NFL, and Curry Frazier from the NHL. And you guys, I mean, you guys work some big games. Uh, Curry, you, you alluded to it when we first got, when we first opened up when you said boo, but what's it like? What's it like uh, being in, in game seven of the Stanley Cup? Love it. And, and getting booed? Love it. I'll tell you what. <laughs> no, I, I, seriously, the tougher the game, the more I, I, I love being involved. When I saw something happen in a previous game and I got a back-to-back -back or in a playoff series and I've got to come in and clean up Dodge, it, it, it energizes you, it excites you. I had a game one time, I got a phone call, I'm at home, nothing, you know, day off. I got a call from John McCauley, he said, Kerry, I'm sorry, to, it's on the weekend. He said, I'm sorry, you don't get weekends off, but I got to have you go to Hartford. Hartford played in Boston last night. I had both coaches, both general managers, and both owners call me. It was a crap show. And he said, I got to get you to go in there because we're playing back to back. And, and he said, World War III could have run. So I go in there, uh, you know, I, I show up, uh, reassignment, get into Hartford. I step on the ice, Ray Bork and uh, uh, the captain of the Hartford Whalers at the time. Both of them met me as, I, as they came onto the ice. And they said, oh, my God, are we ever glad you're here? You wouldn't believe what happened last <laughs> night. We thought somebody was going to get killed. That excites me. So you obviously get more satisfaction from the players uh, giving you accolades and the, the fans booing you. What's respect? We develop respect and rapport. Rapport first, and then comes respect. And that's what I was talking about earlier. When you have to develop relationships, Rick Tockett, buddy of ours. Yep. Talk was a young captain of the Philadelphia Flyers. Energized. Over the top. He was like, he could fight, he could score, he was a power forward, he was a leader, but he was out of control with his emotions. And he was getting all kinds of misconducts. He's 22 years old, he's the captain of the Flyers. <laughs> and so he came yelling at me in, in the spectrum one night, and I went, whoa. Open palms, that means peace, right? <laughs> whoa. Not a finger that I'm pointing at him, lecturing right. him, or a fist. Open palms talk calm down we're gonna have a conversation I told him I said listen you're a terrific player you're a young captain I said you can fight you can score you, your leader your players follow you but I said you know what you can't do it from that penalty box over there sitting for 10 minutes at a time where you are too often I want you to play I want you to stay on the ice and if you have a question please 
come and have a conversation with me. Let's talk about it. Boom. I could see the light go on, and from that point on, Rick Tockett and I developed a relationship professionally that carried us through the, his until he left the ice. So, Javi, I guess it's an open line of communication, same in the NBA? Amazing. It's just hockey and basketball are very similar that way because you're one on one right there. You're in the rink and we're on the court and you're close, in close quarters. But Curry, notice what Curry just talked about. He didn't talk about a play or anything like that, no. He's talking about what Bob said before controlling a game, getting the respect. We're not there to be liked. Joe Crawford told me years ago, he says, you go out on the floor, you're not there to be liked, you're there to be respected. So when the players saw Curry, it was the respect. They might not like the guy, but they knew tonight's game is going to be called fine. We got, you know, we're, it's in Curry's hands. And that's what you need. And what Curry was saying about the things that I know what I miss are games like that, um, are games of, like you say, cleaning it up, where you see in a playoff series, the game before you have to work, and you see all this stuff happening, and you go, whoa, it's going to be a tough one, but that's the challenge, the challenge to control the game that night. We're here with the Referee Roundtable Show live at Charlie's Bar. Come on down, meet the guys, have a couple drinks or a few seats open, as Curry said. <laughs> Big Mac, I know coming from coming out of Annapolis and Haddonfield High School, you were no nonsense. But you, I remember some of the stories you used to tell about some of the guys giving you a hard time. Uh, but you, you kept things ship shape. Well, as I said earlier, we and these these gentlemen are right on point. It's a matter of the respect that you carry. It's how you carry yourself, how you handle the players, and there's another element that your listeners. Uh, haven't gotten yet, but is so important, and that's the preparation. And Steve's dad insisted when I came into the league that he wasn't going to go on any football stadium in anywhere in the United States with me unless I was prepared. <laughs> and and preparation is what brings the respect. How you handle, I was taught at the Naval Academy how to handle people, how to control people, what leadership meant. You know what? We're leaders. We're decision makers, but we're leaders. When we walk out there and that game's a, a Super Bowl and it's going to China and it's going to Russia and you've got a mic on your belt and everything that's set into that mic is going to be heard around the world, you better be respected and those guys better know that you're there because you know what you're doing. You're prepared, and you're going to do it right, and you're going to keep things under control. So let's talk about the element in the in the uh, in the uh, in the room. Let me ask you a quick question. Ahead. Let me jump in here real fast. I want to ask you two guys because Curry, you, you just I thought of something you just said about the big game and so on and so forth. The the Super Bowl, um, you know, the the final, the uh, Stanley Cup Finals, the NBA Finals. Did you guys find that the bigger the game, the easier it was to referee? You got that right. I just, I felt, and I'll give you my opinion. You get in the first round of the playoffs, team one versus team eight. Big difference. It's tough, refereeing, because teammates struggling in there, even though they're in the playoffs. It's a tough team. They got to cheat to win. Almost, yeah. <laughs> I, people would say, how do you, like, Curry, how do you do the, uh, the finals, and how do you do the Super Bowl? Well, first of all, preparation and concentration, obviously, we know. But to me, it was, it's those two teams are playing the best at that time and moment of the season, and it made it easier for me anyway, like, in officiating. I, Absolutely I just right. Anyway. Game sevens are easy. I found game sevens easy. The last one I did, Ray Bork won the won the Stanley Cup for the first time. It was the Jersey Devils in game seven in, uh, uh, no, actually it was uh, Tampa. Tampa won uh, over Calgary in uh, 2004. But I want to talk just about preparation because that is crucial. And that's what we had to do when we added an extra official onto the under the ice, an extra official on the field or, or in the, the uh, basketball court. Because you had to prepare, as a, as a veteran guy, you had to prepare your crew. In hockey, each referee had the same authority. So I could screw it up just like the other guy could at the other end. We needed to mesh. And when it was a one-guy game, and, and the one guy in control, it was his game. He didn't have to worry about replay. He wanted to see everything. And I had a game and I wasn't prepared. It was in the Chicago Stadium. And the New York Islanders were on their way to win four Stanley Cups. Al Arbor, I had the most <laughs> respect for. He was a gentleman. If he yelled, I knew I screwed up. This was an afternoon game on ESPN uh, in Chicago. 
I was brutal. I was a, it was a slow start. I had this really disciplined New York Island team, three penalties right in a row in the first five minutes. Mm. Al Arbert had mm. enough of me. He's standing, <laughs> and I'm down waiting for the face-off, and he's got his hands on his hips standing in the open uh, bench door, and he called me. He said, Gary, get over here. I skated over like a little kid. I knew I was sucking. i got to tell you, I, I, I was a slow start for me. And I stood with my head down in front of Al Arbor, and I said, yes, Al. He said, what the heck are you doing out here? He didn't say heck, but he said, what the H are you doing out here? And he's got his hands in his hips, and I looked up at him and very sheepishly, and I said, Al, I'm really sorry. I'm struggling. I don't know what the heck's going on out here. <laughs> and his lips pursed, and he thought for a second, and he said, well, get out there and try harder. I said, okay, Al. And I shuffled off like a little kid that just got lectured from his dad. <laughs> right, right, right. What about the intimidation factor, Big Mac? I mean, uh, when you first were, you know, your first game that you called in 1980, uh, as a head not, referee, I mean, he's not gonna be I know he was like, but I mean, you know, oh, you remember man. some of the big names that you on the this side, like Don Shula for, you know, it's just, he used to tell me all the things that he used to say to you. And uh, this answer is real easy. <laughs> <laughs> if they can intimidate you, you better go bowling on because <laughs> you're in the wrong place. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the yeah, elephant in the room, Javi. Instant replay. I mean, yeah. you know, you're talking about, I guess, the word that everybody uses, indisputable evidence. Mm -hmm. Indisputable evidence. The angle could be different. You know, you're in the replay booth in, for these marquee games in the NBA and, and throughout the playoffs. Now, Billy, you're right. It's How do you look at this? It's, the funny thing is, is what, being in the booth now, it's almost hard. It's hard for me to... Um, realize that I was on the floor for 25 years making these calls. It's really kind of crazy when you step away from it and then you now look at these plays and I have nine different camera angles I can look at on each play. And there were times I'm looking three, four, five times and I go I have no idea. But when I know when I used to work you had to call that play immediately. Because you were right guys, there. These guys are doing it. So replay, I mean, it's it's it doesn't what it does for the fan, local no, normal fan is it shows the angles, and they say, how could that guy miss it? Oh, my gosh. Not to pick on the, the NFL, but like the recent Eagles game with yes. the face mask. I mean, the first thing I look at, though, see, when I look at replay, the first thing I look at, because I would do it for myself when I worked, what angle did he have? Where did he see it? And, of course, the nine times out of ten, the guy's going to get the right call if he's in the NFL or NHL or NBA, if he's in the right angle and sees the play. Nine times out of ten, at least, he's going to get it right. So when he misses something that blatant, he obviously had the wrong angle. So replay with all these technology and all, the fans look at it and think officiating's easy. How could he miss? I mean, my nephews, my you know, my in-law, Steve, you saw that. How could he miss that? And I go, well, if he had the angle that the camera had, it would've been really easy. He just throw the flag. He didn't have that angle. My dad taught me that years ago. I was an Eagles fan growing up and still am today. And I remember like telling my dad watching the game and my dad was officiating at the time and I go dad how could he miss that play <laughs> and the thing is his son he says you didn't have that angle that he had and that doesn't mean the angle is a good one obviously it was a bad one and so I think replay shows it shows the fans first of all that they think officiating is easy and it's not and number two it, it exposes really exposes the officials I mean we could be 90 percent for the game or 95 percent but people see the one or two calls you missed, and uh, it's tough. But replay, replay is is. Is it good, good for the game, Jeff? Do you, do, you, do you think the game has improved because of e uh, replay in the NBA? Hmm. That's has it improved? <laughs> Look at Big Mac. No, no. The game. The, I don't. I don't think it's improved officiating. I don't think it's improved officiating because of the fact that sometimes now, and if I was working today. I would be relying on it also, and I would be do refereeing. You think the, do you think the guys rely on sure it? Sure they do, and, and they should because they're getting graded on this stuff. And I, I, My hardest call my, for me was goaltending, and it was always with the secondary defender. And I could never – I was just horrible at it, just very, very bad. So now there's a rule in the last two minutes of the game or last two minutes of overtime, if you call a goaltending or basket interference, you can review it. Well, I know one thing. I'd be calling it in the last two minutes. Why wouldn't I use replay? Why, why should I be wrong? But is, does that make me a better referee? No, it doesn't. Now, I know, you know Big Mac, you're very opinionated on the on the uh, instant replay. Uh, well, what are you, what are you going to tell? <laughs> Bill, we've talked before. I mean, it's inevitable because the technology, the finite technology that is out there today is part and partial to the entertainment business. 
Our sports are in the sports entertainment business. So those of us that do this work have to accept the fact, if you raise your kids today, I would certainly think it's a lot tougher than it was for our parents to raise us because it's a different world. Well, the sports marketing business has insisted that the technology that's out there be infused into a game that I played, loved, was simple, was smash mouth and everything. I, I loved it and I officiated it because what challenge, what challenge could you get in the world any greater? And to walk the out on reality the field, show out there. walk out on the field with one city competing with another city, and you own not only have the responsibility, you're in charge. You're in charge. Now, if you're not prepared, you don't belong there. <laughs> and you're talking to three guys that have probably prepared themselves to death. We're on the beach. We probably spent on the beach hour after hour after hour with that book reading and reading so that when something happened, we'd be ready. But anyway, it's inevitable. It's there. You know I'm not in love with it. You know why I'm not in love with it. But, uh, you know, free times are free time. Free timeouts are free timeouts. And the replay system gives teams free timeouts. I don't like it. Curry? I got to tell you, I, I think that the uh, instant replay, we're not going back. We're not turning the hands of time back. It's here. It's going to stay. But... In the NHL, the problem is it has diminished the qual the capabilities of the officials, two referees on the ice. They use it as a safety net. They're afraid to make the call, and the reason is because the guys that are reviewing it that have the final call to make are not former officials. They're former hockey players in the NHL Hockey Operations Department. And I just said to Bob at the break, if Bob, if you were up in the booth and I was on the field, and we had to go to replay and you had already looked at the play and you said to me carrie this is what i see and this is the call and we're looking at it together and i'm going to say thanks bob trust you 100 percent great call i appreciate it you got it right for us thank you but if it's a i've had conversations on the ice with former players that are linked into my headset and they've told me no goal and i've said okay tell me why well, then they described the play. And I said, yeah, that's what I saw. And I want you to go back to this. And I want you to look at the far side of the net. Instead of a player driving to the net, which is what he's supposed to do, and that's their mindset, I want you to look at the other side of this play. And that's why it was legal. And that's why it's a good goal. So you can get into a big dispute. With your replay official, and I that have. takes away from the. I have. Well, we're going to get into. We're going to get the next when we come back from the next break. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, being second guessed, and I think that's one thing that sticks in everybody's crawl here. I want to remind people that the first hour of the locker room is sponsored by Tom's River Volkswagen, with over 500 cars in stock. It's the area's number one Volkswagen dealership with free loaner cars every day. We sell cars the right way every day. That's Tom's River Volkswagen. Hey, there are many reasons why your home needs a facelift, fire damage, water damage from broken pipes. Maybe there is storm damage and mold is invading your house. No matter the reason, the one thing that doesn't change is that it's your home. And you want to work with a contractor who cares as much as you do. American Restoration and Rebuilders is local and family owned. And every day they work with families just like yours to help them rebuild and restore. So whether you've suffered fire, water, or mold damage, call George at American Restoration and Rebuilders. Disaster certified with 24-hour emergency services. Call today for a free estimate. They'll assess your damage, advise you on your rights with the insurance company, and rebuild your home. Go online at AmericanRestorationRebuilders.com. Or call, uh, or call them at 609-938-6198. They're Angie's List approved, and they have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. So give George a call today, 609-938-6198. I uh, want to remind people that my Referee Roundtable show is brought to you by Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtors, with offices in Northfield, Brigantine, Margate, Ocean City, Sea Isle, Avalon, and Stone Harbor. Your one-stop shop at the shore for all your real estate needs. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtors, opening doors to life's most meaningful dreams. And by Stella Exteriors. They've been providing top quality roofing and siding at affordable prices since 1996. Did you know that only 2% of roofing contractors qualify as GAF Master Elite installers? So if you do the math, choosing Stella Exteriors takes 98% of the worry out. Give Stella Exteriors a call today. 
one eight seven seven fix roof that's one eight seven seven fix roof when we return we'll finish the first hour of the Re referee roundtable show live from charlie's bar and restaurant in summers point new jersey you're listening to the locker room with billy schwein on 97.3 espn uh, we're back here in the locker room we're here at charlie's bar and restaurant lo located in summers point new jersey come on down there's a couple seats available, Curry. <laughs> have a have a beer. <laughs> we can't hear Javi. Uh, Javi's uh, Javi's. Are we okay now? There we, we go. go. Now we go. Jab, we're talking about second guessing, being second guest. We got about a minute left in this segment. Being second guest, when you're you're you know you're in the booth, you gotta you gotta dispute or go against what was called on the on the uh, on the court. Right. How, how how difficult is that? Well, as we were talking during the break, it's, you have to be. You have credibility there, and you have to live up to that. You have to be honest with the play. If an official misses the call, you've got to explain why. I mean, that, that's the biggest question we all asked ourselves when we were working. When we missed the call, first of all, you have to be objective, number one, with yourselves. That's the number one thing an official has to be, to be able to look at the TV and, and look at the tape and go, you know what, I missed that play, but now the question is why? And if you can explain that to the fans, you know what? It's a pretty good thing. It's educational, for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, what, I, what I see th the problem is, is that guys today are relying on the video replay too much. I see them not making a call, be reluctant to make the call. They don't make a signal on a goal because they're deep in the corner. They're in the wrong position. They're not being coached properly in that regard. And they've been incubated in a two referee system where we came up in the one referee system. Bob McElwee's in charge of this game. Boom, he puts the ball down, bang. He's in charge. Now you got two guys that are soft and they're standing. I don't know, what do you think? What do you think? I hate officiating by committee. I see all in the hockey industry. Home of the Eagles, Sixers, and Flyers. WENJ, WENJ HD, Millville, Atlantic City, 97.3 ESPN. The following is a paid program. The opinions expressed are not those of Town Square Media or station advertisers. Welcome to the locker room on 97.3 ESPN FM. And now here's your host, Billy Schwein. Hi, right, welcome back into the locker room here for my referee roundtable show live from Charlie's Bar and Restaurant in Summers Point, New Jersey on Shore, Shore Road. Come on down, have a have a have a couple drinks, get something to eat. Great food down here. We're we're joined here for my referee roundtable with Bob Mackley from the NFL, former referee Bob Mackley, Steve Javi from the NBA, and Curry Fraser having a great time. Come on down, meet the guys, get your pictures taken. Uh, we're having a lot of fun and. Uh, we are we are ready to go to our fantasy football guru Brian Hartley right now. So let's go to the uh, let's go to the fantasy football guru Brian Hartley. Brought to you by Charlie's Bar and Restaurant, located 800 Shore Road in Summers Point, New Jersey. Meet your friends at Charlie's Bar at the Shore since '44. It's Charlie's Bar and Restaurant Guru. What's up? Uh, I feel a little hungover this morning. I I left Charlie's <laughs> less than ten hours ago. So. I heard I heard all about it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of fun last night. It was a good time, good crowd, and uh, always love heading down there. Well, we're uh, we're 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 waiting for people to start coming in here, Brian. We thought you were gonna have we have you down here for your uh, guru segment. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. Holiday weekend, got a lot of family in town, got some people staying at the house. So uh, you know, we're hanging out today, enjoying this unbelievable weather for end of December. Well, I'll tell you what, week 17 in the NFL, Brian, and a lot of a lot of uh, crucial games coming up, especially for the Eagles. We'll get into that here in a few minutes. Um, uh, but fantasy football-wise, it's getting down to the nitty-gritty. Most people are playing, getting ready for their uh, championship game. Yeah, so in a lot of leagues, uh, the season ended last week. A lot of leagues go through week 16, uh, but there are some that go through week 17, and that's crucial for this week because as we talked on uh, a little bit last week, you know, there's a lot of guys that aren't going to play, a lot of guys that you rely on all season, your Drew Breeses and uh, guys like that that are not going to play at all and other guys that are going to play limited and you're not really sure who to play and who to go to. So this week, you know, you're kind of looking at a lot of backup guys and trying to, to you know, understand who is going to be the guy that's going to see the most time and could have the biggest impact. So it's a struggle uh, this week, but we're going, to, we're going to make it happen and we're going to give you some good advice. All right, so give us uh, your picks for week 17. I know it's a, it's a, like I said, you just said it's a short week as far as playing with not on, as many players in the league, but what do you have for us this week, Brian? 
Yeah, so a quarterback, I got Nick Foles going against Washington. Obviously, a huge game. Nick Foles has been playing unbelievable, and uh, you know, I feel like he's going to win us the game again this week. And we're going to have to sit back and see if Minnesota can, you know, fumble the ball here and give us a win and let us uh, get into the playoffs. And that'd be phenomenal. Also, like Lamar Jackson going against Cleveland and Jameis Winston going against Atlanta at running back, Damian Williams. Spencer Ware is back, but I think they're going to give him a little more rest this week. And Damian Williams has been playing phenomenal. In fact, he just got a two-year contract extension. He's going against Oakland. C.J. Anderson filling in for Todd Gurley. Had 160 yards and a touchdown last week going against San Francisco. Jamal Williams going against the Detroit Lions. And I like Darren Sproles this week. He's running a uh, four-game streak here with a touchdown. He's averaging about 12 points per week in PPR. He's really catching the ball out of the backfield. And him and Foles seem to have a great rapport. So I like... Uh, I like him this week at wide receiver. Doug Baldwin starting to come on. Had a lot of injuries earlier in the season. Uh, you know, they're going to need a win this week, and uh, they're going against Arizona, who's just really has been awful. They're talking about a coaching change there after just one season, so that should be interesting. Jordy Nelson, a guy that, uh, you know, looked like he could be retiring, has been playing well as of late going against Kansas City. And Julian Edelman, who is just steady as we go. The guy is always getting catches underneath, and uh, he scores touchdowns uh, every now and then. But now with Josh Gordon out, he seems to be the main guy for Tom Brady going into the end of the season, going against the New York Jets. Those are my picks for Week 17. Best of luck to everybody that's still out there that's got action going this week. It's going to be exciting. Uh, listen, as Eagles fans, no bigger week for us uh, you know, than this week. We're looking to make a little headway and get in there. Well, like you alluded to earlier, uh, Guru, uh, Nick Foles with, what, 471 yards last year, he, he really racked up the points for people that are still playing and, and might be able to grab, pick them up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, a lot of leagues he's available because there are a lot of guys that are out of it that aren't making drop ads. So you're talking about a, only a couple teams, really, in some leagues that have something to play for. So, you know, he, I'm looking at percentages. He's only owned in about 30% of the leagues out there. So, you know, if you have an option, it's a guy who's going to have to play the entire game. You're not going to have to worry about them being rested. And I think he's got a phenomenal matchup. And, God, he's been playing lights out. So, you know, if you can get him, uh, he's a guy I'd lean towards uh, this week. All right, Guru, give us a pick for uh, Sunday's game against the Redskins. Yeah, I'm going with the Birds. Uh, definitely I'm going 27-17 Eagles. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I have high degree of confidence in the Eagles pulling it out. And it's just going to be a matter of sitting back and seeing what happens. And what do you think? Did, did the Bears beat the Vikings, or uh, do we not make the playoffs this year? You know, the big thing is the, the Bears, you know, they don't really need the win. Uh, they're already in. You know, there's some things that could happen, but – I don't know. I mean, the question's going to be how much are they going to play their guys? Are they going to rest anybody? You know, Minnesota's obviously got to go all out. They've got to win the game. But if you look at Minnesota historically and Cousins, doesn't play well outside. And it's going to be in Chicago, windy. It's going to be a little chillier. Um, there's that front moving across. So it could be interesting. I, I got to like the Bears in this game, and I, I hope they get it done for us. That'd be nice. I saw I saw a stat. I believe he's 5-21 and 21 against teams that are uh, with winning records. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, they went out. They spent a lot of money to get him. Uh, I understand a lot of quarterbacks don't hit free agency like that. So, you know, when someone does. Uh, but uh, hindsight, you know, they gave him an awful lot of money. It's going to eat up a lot of cap space. And so far, not really getting the numbers done. I know there was some talk on NFL radio this morning. He's got the second highest completion percentage behind Drew Brees. His, his interception ratio is good, this, that. But, you know, they were playing really well last year, especially at the end of the season, of course, until they came into the link. And uh, that didn't go so well for him. But, uh, you know, he's they've, they've put all their eggs in his basket. And it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over the next couple of years. But uh, I'm not – yeah. I'm so sorry to mean to cut you. All right, Guru, it's been a great year. Are we going to squeeze one more week out of you? Yeah, I'm here. Whatever you need, you know, we'll talk playoffs next week. Hopefully we'll, we'll be talking about the birds. All right, there's my fantasy football guru, Brian Hartley, brought to you by Charlie's Bar and Restaurant, located at 800 Shore Road in Summers Point, New Jersey. We're here today. Meet your friends at Charlie's Bar at the Shore since 44. It's Charlie's Bar and Restaurant. Now let's get back to the big three. Oof. Let's get back to the big three. We have our referee roundtable. Uh, here we're joined with Steve Javi from the NBA, Bob McAwee from the NFL, and Curry Frazier from the NHL. And you, Steve, we were talking about intimidation and, and things like that uh, with, with, in big games and big tight situations. Having replay, does that undermine the officials in, in big games like that? The replay, you saying, yeah. Billy? Uh, I mean, as, as an official, now I know, like if you're on the court and you know 
that you're, you know, you're being looked at. You know what? The, the good ones know because the fact that you're just going to forget the replay is there. If you go into a game thinking you have Big Brother on your shoulder, as Bob said earlier, go bowling on Sunday. You know, even with replay, you've got to go out there with the mentality that you have no safety net. I think the good ones do that, and you referee without a safety net. And if it happens, they can help you along. That's wonderful. Um, because, but I just, I just think that uh, some people are being brought up in this officiating community with replay, and they depend on it too much. They really do. Uh, for us, we came in at the tail end or the beginning, I should say, our tail end of our careers, the beginning of replay, and we just continued refereeing like we normally did. And I think that's a great way to do it. But for the younger officials coming in, you have to remember, it's just like in society, it changes. These guys, it was all technology, and they have Big Brother there. So they might be afraid to make a call or two where we just didn't care. We just called it. And if they want to change it, change it. I wanted to see everything. Right from the, the time I started until the, the very last game I worked in 2010, I wanted to see it all. I refereed the game <clears throat> just like I was out there by myself. Uh, I worked with my partner. I communicated with my partner. I helped pick up things in the transition that he might in the gap. But I refereed that last game, Rangers, Flyers, for the last playoff spot, both tied, went into a shootout, 2010. Oh, I'll never forget that. They, <laughs> Flyers won in a shootout and went to the Stanley Cup final. So that's when that game, the whole season was on the line for both of those teams. Whichever one won it. Now, you, we talked about preparation. It was going to be my last, my final game. I picked my crew. I handpicked my crew. And we had a meeting the night before at my house with the family. And the crew, we sat off to the side. And I said, boys, tomorrow is the biggest game of the season for them and for us. So we need to be ready. We need to be our very best. We're, we're, there's going to be no guessing on a call. But the one thing that we relied on when we didn't have replay was instinct. My gut instinct, because I've saw so many plays, my brain was like a file cabinet, like a computer that pulled out a file. When I moved, I moved instinctively because I knew I couldn't see over a guy the size of these two giants. I had to move in, and I developed a positioning philosophy in the early 1980s that was adopted by Canadian hockey and USA hockey and now around the world because I was small. I recognized my strengths, but I really recognized my deficiencies. Stature was one of them. I had to move in advance of the play. I had to see the, the, the field or the ice just like Wayne Gretzky did and Mario Lemieux and right. all those great players because I had to be ahead of the play mentally move my feet ahead of the play to be in that perfect position because I didn't have replay. I didn't have somebody that say, oh, you, let's get together and let's have a huddle. Bob McAwee, you, uh, you had your same crew each and every Sunday. Same guys on your crew. Right. You, don't have, you didn't have that luxury, right? You guys, no. Do you think that would have, would that help the, the uh, officiating along if you have this, like he had the same guys that he could depend on each and every week. Yeah, some of the guys I would have killed. <laughs> and I think the baseball umpires are that way too. They have they're in crews for the whole year. Yeah, they're, you, so right. you you know it's like your cohesive unit. You know yeah, but what's going on, Big Mac. My comment on that, Bill, is that you know John Madden and dear friend of mine, uh, not when I was working, <laughs> but John John was the one that pushed this putting whole crews together in the playoffs and the Super Bowl rather than the old system where the top ranked man got the job. Let me tell you something. I went out there three times in Super Bowls. I want the best. Yes. I want the best. If that ball comes to that rear pylon and there's 10 seconds left and that guy's got it or he doesn't have it or his foot is or isn't, I want the best they have. And so I disagreed with John vehemently about this. And I still do. Interesting, you have found that they have kind of drifted back now to the best seven guys in the business get the game. But there was a time when the game was being officiated with a back judge. It was number 12 in his position, but with the crew 
that finished. So, you know, sometimes the silk suitors think and think and think and think and overthink. Just like Curry said and Steve has said, give me a football guy. Give me a hockey guy. Yeah. Give me a basketball guy. Enough said. You're only as good as your weakest link. Yep. That's right. Think you guy. got it. All right, we're down here at Charlie's Bar with my referee roundtable <laughs> show live from Charlie's Bar in Summers Point, New Jersey. First hour, the second hour of the locker room is brought to you by the Great Bay Country Club, where it's not just golf, it's fun. Make Great Bay Country Club your club. Great Bay is an award-winning private golf club where you are greeted by name. It's home in the three-hour and 58-minute round. You can play on the 18-hole championship golf course, enjoy fine diner, experience lively atmosphere in the pub. There's a full calendar of golf and social events throughout the season to appeal to everyone. Join today. For more information, go to greatbay.com or call them at 609-927-927. 5071 Great Bay Country Club in Summers Point, New Jersey. See why it's always a great day at Great Bay. And of course, the Referee Roundtable Show is brought to you by Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtors with offices in Northfield, Brigantine, Margate, Ocean City, Seattle, Avalon, and Stone Arbor. Your one stop shop at the shore for all your real estate needs. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtor, Realtors, opening doors to life's most meaningful dreams. And by Stell Exteriors, they've been providing top quality roofing and siding at affordable prices since 1996. Did you know that only 2% of roofing contractors qualify as GF Master Elite installers? So if you do the math, choosing Stell Exteriors takes 98% of the worry out. So give Stell Exteriors a call at 1-877-FIX-ROOF. When we return, we'll continue the roundtable with my three distinguished guests. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to The Locker Room with Billy Schwein on 97.3 ESPN. Back here in the locker room for my referee roundtable show live from Charlie's Bar and Restaurant located in Summers Point, New Jersey on Shore Road. I'm joined with Steve Javi, former NBA official, Bob McAwee from the NFL, and Curry Frazier from the NHL. And we were just talking during the break, Curry, about uh, making a call in front of millions of people and not knowing if it was the right call or even second-guessing yourself. Well, what, what do you do when you know it was the wrong call? What do you do? That's the that's the real question. Is it about the game? Is it about making this game better and right? Or do you? What's the protocol? I mean, well, there there wasn't one, uh, <laughs> but I kind of reinvented one here. I'm going to give you two real quick, <laughs> real quickies. So I, I'm working with a young French kid. He's, his English is horrible. He's he's a young referee doesn't speak really good English before the game we get a sheet in the dressing room and it says how many who's on the bubble for uh, instigator fights because if they get the next one they're out of the game and they get a one game suspension so I identified the guy on the list plays for the St. Louis Blues the game is in Colorado so I said okay if this guy gets in a fight we're gonna make sure that he earns if it's an instigator to be called we're gonna make sure he earns it no softies here because he's gonna get ejected and he's got a one game sit okay I get that I got that so we have towards the end of the first period two fights happen at the same time I got the one fight the other kids got the other fight we get together at the end when the the linesman break them up and I said what have you got he said I got instigator on that guy there the the one I said are you serious I said and I caught it out of the side of my eye. It didn't look like it. He said, yeah, for sure. He's an instigator. I said, okay. <laughs> so he gets thrown out of the game. There's a, there's a, like a minute and five seconds left in the period. They, they have to serve an extra minor plus the guys out of the game. Plus he's going to get a, a game suspension. We go in the dressing room. I said, would you show me like what it was he did and, and explain it to me? He said, well, the guy start push. He pushed back. The other guy pushed him back. And the, the guy, the buddy there that I gave out a game, he dropped his glove first and they fight. I said, that's not an instigator. That's simultaneous. It's, it's combustion. I said, oh, my God. So I get on the, the red phone in the room, like back to Toronto. I call and I'm talking to Mike Murphy, the vice president of hockey ops. I said, Mike, we got a problem here. Uh, he said, no kidding. He said, I've got both, <laughs> both general managers already called me, wanting to know why this guy's out of the game. I said, well, it was, it was a, a, a language difficulty. I said, he said, what do you want to do? I said, we got to fix this. I said, fortunately, they haven't scored a goal on the, on the one-minute power play. I'm saying we get this guy 
back. I'm going to meet with the two general managers down here at the room. I'm going to explain the situation. We're going to put the guy back in the game. We're going to take the remaining minor penalty off the board. I'm going to make an announcement at the start of the period, and we're going to play on. He said, perfect, great, let's do it. And that's what we did. I took, we had a penalty on the, on the clock. You got 20,000 people that think their team has got a power play for another minute, and we changed it. Boom. How did you explain that, Curry, to I, the 18,000 people and the who, TV. Wanted, who wanted to kill you? The TV. I said, I made the explanation, but I said to the buddy, I said, hey, listen, when I make this announcement, they're lined up, you drop that puck quick. <laughs> Keep it moving. Get it Keep moving. it moving. Billy, I have a quick comment. That's why he was one of the greatest that ever put skates on. That's right. Well, thanks, Bob. No doubt. The ability, to, the ability to change. But, you know, I have a story here. I was <laughs> sharing a little bit of it in the break um, about about changing a call. I made a call in a game that I anticipated, unfortunately, cardinal mistake, anticipated the call. We want to anticipate the play so you're in the right <laughs> position. I anticipated the call, put my hand in the air for a foul, and as I'm walking to the table, realize it's not right. I got to change this. And I change it, thinking I'm doing the right thing. This is kind of early in my career, wasn't there? And I said, it's the only time I've done it, and you'll see the reason why. I said, I, it's not a foul. Ball's going to be on the side. No, the ball's going to be a jump ball. It was loose when I blew the foul, so we have to jump ball. And while the team, the visiting team's going crazy. No, no, you called the foul. I said, you know and I know it was not a foul. So I just figured I'm doing the right thing for the game, as you say, Curry. Yeah. Well, of course, the, the team, the visiting team, just – they're so upset. And if the basketball guys were with me, the jump ball would have went to that team. Well, you know, the reason why I'm telling the story, it didn't go to that team. <laughs> and the other team scored off the jump ball. Now they call a timeout, the team, and they're still they're yelling out. I have to call a technical foul on the coach, a technical <laughs> foul on the player. And as they went to the timeout, the radio guy's looking at me, giving me the choke signal <laughs> at the bench. He takes his headset off, throws it, and, gives, and I go walking over to the guy and – very immature conversation occurred between the two of us and i said i got the pr guy for the i says come over here get this guy off the table so the radio guy it was hot and the, the, the mic was hot and everything and it was the funniest thing because espn showed it and it was like like the 911 call like bleep bleep bleep, 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 bleep. well i think there were like a couple words you could see in there the and you and so on all the other words were bleeped out redacted. that goes to say I tried to do the right thing, and then unbelievable. What unbelievable. What you, you ejected the radio. Uh, and no, oh, my gosh. Oh my. And that guy never let me forget about it, obviously. <laughs> right. We're here at Charlie's Bar and Restaurant for a referee roundtable show brought to you by Berkshire Halfway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtors, with offices in Northfield, Brigantine, Margate, Ocean City, Seattle, Avalon, and Stone Harbor, your one-stop shop at the shore. For all your real estate needs, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Fox and Roach Realtors, opening doors to life's most meaningful dreams, and Stell Exteriors. They've been providing top quality roofing and siding at affordable prices since 1996. Did you know that only 2% of roofing contractors qualify as GF Master Elite Installers? So if you do the math, choosing Stell Exteriors takes 98% of the worry out. Give Stell Exteriors a call today at 1 877 Fixed Roof. There can be many reasons why your house needs a facelift. Fire damage, water damage from broken pipes, maybe there is mold damage and mold is invading your house. No matter the reason, the one thing that doesn't change is that it's your home and you want to work with a contractor who cares as much as you. American Restoration and Rebuilders is local and family owned and every day they work with families just like yours to help them rebuild and restore. So whether you've suffered fire, water or mold damage, call George at American Restoration and Rebuilders. Disaster certified with 24-hour emergency services. Call today for a free estimate. They'll assess your damage, advise you on your rights with the insurance company, and rebuild your home. Go online at AmericanRestorationRebuilders.com or call them at 609-938-6198. They're Angie's List approved, and they have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Give George a call today, 609-938-6198. When we return, we'll continue with our Referee Roundtable show live from Charlie's Bar. You're listening to The Locker Room with Billy Schwein on 97.3 ESPN. We're back here in The Locker Room live at Charlie's Bar and Restaurant in Summers Point, New Jersey for the Referee Roundtable show. Come on down, meet the guys. We're going to be hanging out for a little bit. We got Steve Javi from the NBA, Bob McAwee from the NFL, and Curry Frazier from the NHL. And uh, we're having a great time just uh, talking about officiating, which not too many people, and Bob McAwee alluded to it at the break, not too many people understand what in 
takes place with refereeing. No, I mean, we could, we could have this show for almost eight hours and talk <laughs> about it because people don't understand. And matter of fact, oh, get another beer on Billy. There. Okay, <laughs> get another beer. Okay, good. I'll run um, my tab up. <laughs> you know, I was, I was curious, Billy. Where I'm sitting here, I'm looking at these two legends in my mind and two guys I respect the utmost. And I, I'm just curious because I think fans and people are listening would want to know how they got started in the fishing. I mean, why do want people want to take this abuse nowadays? Right. But how, I'll start with Bob, but how did you get started, Bob? Why did you get into it? And, you know, how, what would you say to somebody who wants to get into it? Well, Steve, obviously, uh, I had played in high school and played at the Naval Academy. And after flight training, played again in service football, which in my day was a big deal. Great, Great Lakes had teams and everybody had professional players playing for them and guys like me. However, Love the game, absolutely love the game. So when I looked at the officiating idea, the thought came to me, how can you give back what you've spent all these years learning and doing, number one? And number two, I guess I was a challenge chaser. That's kind of where my head always was. But what bigger challenge could anybody accept than go out whether the kids are Pop Warner kids and somebody's little boy or somebody's grandson, or whether you're working a Super Bowl, you have a responsibility to that game to control it, keep it fair, and keep it safe. Now, the next thing that, uh, that I loved about officiating was that if you worked hard at it and you got good at it, nobody could know the president of the league and get a job. Nobody could know the wife of the chairman of the board of the <laughs> Dolphins because what you do out there at our level, everybody sees. Everybody in the country sees everything you do. So you can't hide. You either have to earn your stripes or you don't belong there. What well, greater well, challenge, well what greater challenge could anybody have than to walk out there and say, we're playing for all the money, baby. This is my game. So Bob, that's kind of what yeah, Bob, trapped me into the challenge. And who, who got you started, Bob? Well, you know who got me started. <laughs> Your father did. Not before my dad. Before, <laughs> no, see, I know my dad took you under his wing and so on. But before that, to get okay. into like, the college level or the level okay. before. I came back from the service. I played a lot of football. They asked me to help a coach at the high school for a year, which was interesting because my level of expertise was way above what a young kid would do. So I wasn't able to teach them much. So the college, uh, the high school football coach said, why don't you go try officiating? I had, and that's just how it happened. So we went to Collingswood, his high school, every Monday night classes yeah. for you young guys that are out there that would like to sit where we sit. And I tell young people this all the time, don't let anybody tell you that it can't happen. Because here's three guys will tell you it can happen. We had to go to classes every Monday night. Yeah, I, re we had, I remember that growing up, watching all the referees show up. Had to get a rule home. book. Had to qualify to go to the state Rutgers mm -hmm. to take the examination. So it's a long process. But for young guys that love sports, all I can tell you is here's three guys that took all over the world. I refereed NFL football in Berlin, Germany, Dublin, Ireland, wow, the right. Hawaiian Islands, mm -hmm. and I met some of the greatest people in the world. And I'm sitting here with a couple of them today. Mm -hmm. So Jav, that's my story. And Jav, you were you were baseball. You I was used, a baseball you used to go down guy. Baseball. But I'm just curious though. I'm going to stick. I'm going to go to Curry right now. Curry, same question to you. How did you get started? Why? And who was instrumental in? in doing this for you? Well, you know, as Bob said, everybody and anybody can do this. They can they can have a dream. I never did. I shouldn't have been there. I was a good little hockey player in Canada. I played to the junior A level where the teams draft from. I was the captain of my team. Last guy, uh, Mark Howe. Uh, I hit him with an open ice hit uh, as a 19 year old I was in uh, the Olympia Stadium and my inside shook. We both stood there <laughs> looking at each other and it was vibrating <laughs> and I went, oh my God, I, I got to get out of this, this game. So I wasn't drafted. I had a whole bunch of U.S. Uh, Division I scholarship offers. Uh, wasn't inclined to move in that direction. And a friend, my dad played minor pro hockey. He was a real tough guy. I, I mean, he mentored me as courageous. I, I, 
I fought a lot as a player. I hated bullies, uh, big guys, and, and so I had this type A aggressive personality. But Ted Garvin, who was coaching, he saw me, he played pro with my dad and he saw me all the way up play. He was coaching in the International Hockey League at the time and then moved on to the Detroit Red Wings as a coach. He said, Kerry, why don't you get into officiating? He said, we need guys that understand the game, that play to a good level. They understand the emotions of the coaches, the players. He said, here's a brochure to a referee school. Boom. The 1972 expansion. World Hockey came in. NHL. I said, okay, I'll pay 250. I went for five days. It was uh, uh, late in September. I was scouted at that referee school. I put the stick away. I put all my gloves in the closet. I've now got a referee jersey on, and I'm going to be the best I can be at this in five days. Paid really close attention, read the rules. I got scouted, invited to the NHL training camp for officials two days later. Come on, you never refereed before <laughs> this? Never refereed oh before. My. Holy so, moly. That shows you anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, you got a shot, Billy. <laughs> yeah. I think my referee days are. So I Wait, ended up my. my I go to 10-day training camp. My first exhibition game was the Minnesota North Stars and the oh Detroit Red Wings. Never refereed a game before. Never. No. Well, that, well, that, Billy, I'm sorry. I'm taking a shot at him. That's, <laughs> that's why the NHL referees are the way they are. No, I'm just I'm just <laughs> yeah. obviously, obviously, they don't do that now. No. God, no. they're worse, worse now than that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. He's Holy. not a hockey official. He's a magician. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Curry, that's a, that's amazing. That's an incredible story. Yeah, uh, right place, right time, well, right aptitude. But you know what? When I said about previously about deficiencies, I recognized in an argument with Wayne Gretzky in my rookie season in the NHL that I had to change some things about my personality that were re reflex, and my my as a player fought, dropped the gloves, boom. The bigger the guy, easier to punch <laughs> up than down, and so that I wasn't intimidated. Bob McElwee, you're not going to intimidate no. either of these two guys. No. So, But I carried that personality, that negative component as an official, which really helped me as a player. And I got into an argument with Gretzky in the game. He took a dive the very first shift. Flyers, Bobby Clark and the boys oh. are playing. And I, exa like, I got stubborn. And he, when Gretzky got fouled in that game, I, I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't call it. I thought, okay, you're going to embarrass me in front of your 16, 18,000 people and they're booing the shit out of me. I'm not calling it when you take a dive. And then when it's legit, I'm not calling it. So the end of the game, Flyers are winning by one goal. Pelly Lindbergh catches the puck. I blow the whistle, kill the play. Gretzky in his office behind the back of the net. He, nobody around him. He jumped in the air, threw his arms out front, legs out back, boom, <laughs> belly flop. Bobby Clark skated over to him with no teeth. He said, get up, Gretzky, you <laughs> blank baby. I went over and I said, Wayne, what are you doing? There was nobody within 15 feet of you. He said, you wouldn't have called it anyway. You haven't called a blank thing all night. I said, you're right. I'm going to start right yeah. now. Boom, you got two for unsportsmanlike. He said, thanks. It's about blank time. You called something, and he stormed to the dressing room. Funny story. But the truth is, after every game, I went back and replayed that game in my mind. Was there something I could have done better or differently to achieve a better outcome? Yeah. Like a board hit me between the eyes. I compromised my integrity, the integrity of the rules, the game I love, my employer, and I had to change, and I did from that point. Well, you know, Curry, I have you to blame then. I was in a hotel. Just because in the NHL you can, in five days, be a referee. <laughs> Okay, that's He's what it sounds you like. I'm yeah. never going to let him live. I'm in a hotel <laughs> after a game one time, and fans were in the hotel, which I never like to get near the fans, but luckily the home team won, so we're okay. <laughs> and a guy comes up to me, starts a conversation, and says, how do I be? Hey, this is cool. How do I become a referee? You don't know. How do, I, how do I become an NBA referee? I go, well, do you referee now? He says, no. I said, well, how about starting with fifth and sixth grade boys and girls? I didn't know I should have assigned him to the hockey guy. And he could have refereed. And with it, I would say within a week's time, you can be in the NHL. Curry, that's it. You just opened up a can of worms. I love it. Uh, Bob said anybody can do it. <laughs> All right, Jack, we got about two minutes left. I want to, you know, you started out in baseball. I started out in baseball. I was more of a baseball player. And obviously, from the background I had with regard to my family ties, my dad being an NFL official. My godfather was an American League umpire. Okay. All right. I was brought up that way. Didn't want to be an official at all. Matter of fact, I was a pain in the neck as a player. 
surprising. <laughs> so it's surprising. But in high school, I probably led my team in technical fouls and basketball. <laughs> but baseball was my first love. Loved playing it when I was not good enough to do it anymore. Um, I got into another business of selling and so on. But I said, you know, at an early age, I want to do something I enjoy, something I have a passion for. And that's what Bob was saying. Kids who are out there now, even in high school, college kids who have a passion in sports, who think, well, maybe I'm not good enough to play. Well, guess what? You can put your time and effort into officiating because it's the same feeling. The great thing is we don't have to retire at 30 years old. We can go to a 50 or 60. These guys here will tell you, Billy, to be out there at center ice or in midfield flipping a coin or in Madison Square Garden in a playoff game, the excitement, the, the adrenaline, adrenaline you yeah. get, you continue getting that as an official. A player, you got to retire. Right. So I put I, what I did, Billy, is I went away actually first to umpire school and I umpired in the minor leagues and I refereed. So I umpired in the summertime refereed basketball in the winter even though i love playing baseball the most the the challenge in officiating how much quicker it was it was great we're here at the charlie's bar with our referee round table they were having a great time come on down meet the guys we'll be here for we'll, we'll be here for a little while longer I want to remind people that uh, ocean city's real estate market is red hot you need an agent that has the knowledge and expertise to help contact ocean city's top agent mark rhymes He's been selling real estate for 28 years in South Jersey. He can answer all your real estate questions and find you the perfect property. He's available anytime on a cell at 609-425-2042. When Philadelphia star athletes are looking for a house at the beach, they contact Mark Grimes, specializing in buying and selling vacation homes, single family homes, condominiums, and duplexes, residential and commercial, as well as new construction projects or investment opportunities. Mark Grimes, he's your agent at the beach. Give him a call today, 609-425-2042, or check out the website at grimes.com. Hey, you want tickets to the big game? Don't be left out. Call Mr. Anything, Billy Lombard. He has your seats. Call him right now, 267-761-8688. That's 267-761-8688. The biggest concerts, the biggest games. Call Mr. Anything, Billy Lombard, 267-761-8688. That's his name. Get to the game. All right, when we return, we'll wrap up the Referee Roundtable show. We're live here at Charlie's Bar and Restaurant in Summers Point, New Jersey. You're listening to The Locker Room with Billy Schwein on 97.3 ESPN. Broadcasting live from Charlie's Bar and Restaurant in Summers Point, New Jersey. My referee roundtable show, and I got Steve Javi, Bob Mackey, Curry Frazier here. This, guys, this is just there's not enough time. We're, we got about 15 minutes left in this segment. We, I feel like we're just getting started. And we got hours worth of stories, too, yeah. if you want to do it again. Hey, listen, Josh, my producer, wants to ask you guys a question. Hey, guys, just a couple of things. First of all, so, Steve, first of all to you, I don't know if you saw last night, Blake Griffin took an official aside, showed him on a tablet why he didn't commit a foul all right now the official took time to talk to him explain to him why did you ever experience anything where a player like sat you know, took you aside like hey listen i didn't do this and you had to sit down and explain to him like hey look this is what i saw and this is why i called it now that's crazy it's funny josh you asked that because i looked on espn.com today and i saw that segment <laughs> and i actually looked looked at the replay how he did it I would have thrown the guy out of the game. Absolutely. Are Absolutely. you kidding? He's showing me up. Are what you else is new? Hey, God. Yo, dude, you think, wait, you still think you didn't foul him? I think you did foul him. And you're going to bring a tablet? Curry, that's crazy. Here. He actually, at the timeout, he went and brought the tablet. As soon as he walked on with that tablet, I would have thrown him. Absolutely. <laughs> I, had a, I had a coach one time pull a rule book out of the back of his pocket. And, and went to present it to me. I said, "You better that better be toilet paper that you got in your hand <laughs> That's because right. you're going to go and wipe yourself with it. That's and right. You're out of here. That's right. No. Yeah. So the other thing is everyone always has an opinion. Fans, many people have this opinion. And I want you guys to clarify this. Are there makeup calls? Never. <laughs> He just spoke for all, you know. Yeah, Never. Go ahead. Because I could go on like a well, no. tangent here. Big no, that's time. an easy one. It's, yeah. that's, an, that's, a, that's an easy one. Integrity is what we stand for. I hate to get on a soapbox. No, go ahead. So they can say that all they want. If they want to think, if they, if they want to think that, they got the wrong message. They do. Because we're responsible for the integrity of the game. What are you going to make, two wrong ones? You try to make them right, and if you miss one, you missed it. That's out of your head. You got something else that's, going on that's in why five he, that's seconds. That's why he's so great. But I'll tell you, on the ice, I've seen it. I've seen makeup calls happen, but they were done by weaker officials. Ones that didn't. Have... <laughs> oh, I got him going now. 
I, I, and, and I tell you, they, they, they lacked the courage, they were intimidated, and they felt they had to make it right, and two wrongs never make a right. Now, I, I'll, jump, I'll jump in here, too. Usually the people who say that never officiated, okay? Uh, and I'll just go, let's just go with the monetary thing. I get marked down because I'm going to miss a call intentionally and then not make the playoffs and get extra bonus money just because I want to be your friend and make it up to you. Are you kidding me? I got to support my family, my, you know, my wife and so on. And therefore, I'm getting evaluated and I'll, I'll make my own share of mistakes. I don't need to do it intentionally. You know? Guys, Harry, one more real quick. I just wanted to ask you, what can the leagues do to help officials more? Is there anything that the NBA, NFL, and NHL can do to help officials officiate more? Try to, try to maintain the control and the integrity of the referee's position and his reason for being there. That's what they can do. Empower them to be the very best that they can be, that they have the courage to make the call, to see everything that they need to see, and not be just spectators. I've, I see too many puck watchers that are refereeing the games now in the NHL. They've become passengers on a, on a train. They've got to be the driver of the engine. And I encourage you to hit, hit the nail on the head with that one word, courage. It's so difficult nowadays that I think the league undermines it. You have to have the courage to make that big call, not be afraid to make a mistake. I mean, because nowadays they want you to be, they expect you to be perfect. And when you make a mistake, you see some of these football conferences, they suspend them, they do this, they do, wait a second, there are going to be mistakes. I remember the first couple of years in the league, I had a bunch of bench emptying in fights. I'd come home and my dad would look at me and go, this is the best thing that's going to happen to you. I go, what do you mean? I got fights in my game. What do he goes, you'll learn from this. Yeah. Give them the courage, empower them. Don't be afraid to make a mistake and learn from it. Did you guys ever have a death threat in a game? Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, really? Yeah. yeah. All three of us. Big yeah. Mac, you had one. You had a death threat? But that, well, was, from, that was from his wife. <laughs> 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 yeah, Betty, Betty's over there. <laughs> no, this, this is a quick story, and, I, and we don't have much time. Uh, I was sitting in the dressing room doing a playoff game in New York. These three big guys came in. They said, we're from the FBI. And they said, we're not telling anybody but you there's been a death threat on Richard Todd in this game today. Wow. And you never saw a referee work as far away from <laughs> the referee. Right, right. right. How about you? You, you St. Louis. Uh, it's called the Monday, the Monday Night Miracle. Still on YouTube. Uh, St. Louis beat Calgary in Game Six. They were three goals down at the end of the second period. We, the, the period ended. I just given Rob Ramage, captain of the Blues, uh, he two-handed a guy. It looked like they were going to quit. I read him the riot act. We had uh, a two giant cops come out of the penalty box. They grabbed me. They said, "Kerry, hurry up, get off the ice." They took me around by the glass instead of cutting diagonally across. We get in the dressing room, they said, it's our duty to inform you you've had a death threat. I said, ah, no big deal. Guy sitting at home drinking his Bud Weiser called in. No, traced the call. He's in the arena. Oh, it's man. from a phone in the <laughs> arena. Said he has a gun. You come out for the third period, he's going to shoot you. Boom. That's a defining moment. I, I went say, out. I'd say. All I, all I can say is every night they want to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> right, we, we, we didn't have any hear any booze in here today. No. And listen, guys. Only the stuff we're drinking. I, <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> I'd like to see Billy's tab right now. <laughs> listen, I want to take this time to thank you guys so much. We could we could go on for hours and hours, especially with some of the stories you guys been associated with. Some great games, uh, had great careers, and I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, for coming out and doing the referee round, roundtable show here live at Charlie's Bar. I know uh, Jimmy Thomas would like to say a word. Yeah, I'd like to thank you guys for coming, too. We know Billy doesn't have a lot of friends. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys are friends or not. But uh, to you and your families, have a happy, healthy New Year. Thank, thank you very much. You too, coming. brother. Appreciate it. It's great thank, being thanks, here. Thanks, Jimmy. Great being here, Jimmy. And, uh, thank and, you, and, and, and Charlie's Bar here is going to give each each official uh, a $50 gift certificate uh, and, and a, a – and a Thank token you. of Jimmy and uh, Jeff's uh, appreciation. You guys get a nice Charlie's Bar sweatshirt uh, for to wear. Uh, you know, for the wear it proudly. Get, to, get number ninety-five on it. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. That's all the time we have. I want to thank uh, Berkshire job, Hathaway. I want to thank Stell Exteriors. Thanks for making the locker room part of your Saturday because nothing could be finer than talking sports with the Schweiner. Happy New Year, everybody.